Hi, I'm Kate Stalter with Investors Business Daily, and I'm here today with Bill O'Neill, the IBD founder and the author of the bestseller, How to Make Money in Stocks. Hi, Bill. It's nice to be here. Hey, your book, How to Make Money in Stocks, has sold over two million copies. So why did you decide to go ahead and update the book and revise it now? Well, if you look back in 2000 to 2002, most investors lost 50 to 60 percent of their capital. And then in 2008 and 2009, they repeated, uh, or at least most of them. And I think that after that's happened, most people now realize they've got to get serious about this. They can't just work with it a little bit or can't just delegate it to anybody else. They've got to learn what they're doing because is uh, your money worth uh, something to you? And after you get hit hard twice, I think you realize that the market's not that easy and you better do some homework. So what are the biggest changes in this new edition, Bill? What's new and different this time? Well, the first thing I did is start right off the bat with 100 charts that represented the biggest movers in different cycles going back for 100 years. The reason I started with charts is because over these years I've found that that's the thing that most people have trouble with. First of all, a lot of people don't even use them which is a serious mistake. That's like a doctor saying, I'm not going to use an x-ray or I'm not going to use an MRI. The professionals that really know what they're doing use charts because it's measuring supply and demand. You can analyze whether a stock is really acting properly or not. It's a critical part. So I put that right at the very beginning and we marked up what you're supposed to be able to recognize on a chart. We'd show how a chart should form, uh, the signs that it's under accumulation, the signs that it's not doing well. So that's the first thing that's completely new and different. Uh, it's a lot of them. You've got to trudge through a, a hundred charts. But it also tells you something that patterns on charts are repeated cycle after cycle after cycle. So everybody thinks everything is new because society has changed and there are new products and all. But the charts don't change too much, and they do tell you exactly what's going on. It's just up to you to learn how to read them, so it's important. In Chapter 2, I follow up by separating out all of the specific patterns. We have about nine or ten different patterns. One we call a cup with a handle. It's the most prevailing one, and we have dozens of examples of them. So you can compare one to the other and get to begin to recognize what does that look like. And the whole concept here is if you study it enough, then if you get a chart book or you have a, a system on, on your PC where you can uh, study the charts, each week you can look through and find what stocks now look like they're forming a pattern that is a sound, successful pattern that's always worked in the past. That gives you a huge edge and something that most people should learn. If you're going to invest your money, you might as well uh, have the tools. And if you don't do this, you've got a serious disadvantage because you don't know if you're chasing a stock too high. You don't know if you're buying it when it's under a heavy liquidation. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you can't recognize unless you learn how to read charts. So you don't want to listen to the college professors that may tell you that, oh, they, they're not any good because I don't know too many uh, professors that have made a lot of money in the stock market. In addition to the charts and some of the examples of patterns, you also share investing rules in the book. So can you talk a little about how you came up with the rules and why they're so important for someone who really wants to succeed? Well, Kate, what I found is that most people, for some strange reason, think that because they're bright and intelligent or they made good grades in school or they've got a reasonable IQ, that just because they're smart that they should be able to do well investing. And my experience is the smarter they are, usually the worse they do because they think they know what they're doing. And they don't understand that, that stocks don't act the way they think they act. And uh, so most people have got a lot of ideas that are wrong. And here's how we came up with our rules. We went back and looked in the prior 20 years at which stocks went up the most each year. And they had to at least double or triple before we'd even consider them. Next, we looked at all the variables that were in each one of these stocks that were known at that time. And I'm talking about every variable, all the fundamental variables, earnings, sales, what all, all the technical market variables, price, volume, charts. 
we we looked at all of these without any preconceived idea as what works. In other words, we didn't approach it thinking that, well, PEs are important, our earnings are important, our charts are important. We said, let's look at everything that's known out there and then try to find out what did these variables look like just before the stock that had this huge move took off and tripled or went up five times or whatever. So we built these models and every one of our rules come from the models of how the market actually worked rather than how people think it works or how Wall Street thinks it works. So we don't care what Wall Street is saying or what Wall Street analysts are saying. We're going on historical precedent and we find this system works very well and it picks up a lot of leaders and it eliminates a lot of biases. For example, a lot of people are spoiled in, in this country th uh, thinking that they want something that's on sale. So you want a bargain. In the stock market, it doesn't work that way. The, the best stocks sell at a higher price and they're moving up, not down. And so human nature is geared up to feel that if a stock was 40 and it's now 20 or 30, it must be a bargain. Well, probably something wrong with it because it's come off from 40 to 20 or 30. So we found all these things out by doing a scientific study and coming up with what are the variables like. Now, I'll give you one quick, simple one. A lot of people look at a P-E ratio. Uh, I look at them, but I, I pay very little attention to them because the P-E ratio is not a cause of why a stock goes up. So somebody thinks that a stock is worthwhile because it's at 10 or 20 times earnings. We find that the best stocks, the ones that triple or what all, will uh, have a much higher P.E. It, it, and, and if you looked at ordinary society, you could begin to understand this. Everything sells for what it's worth. So the stock that's down is probably not a very good stock and there's something wrong with it. So we don't put an opinion in that says, oh, I can't buy this because of the P.E. ratio. We found some of the greatest profits that we've made over the years have been in stocks that were selling at 50, 100 times earnings. We, we bought AOL when it was selling for 300 times earnings and we sold it when it was around 700 times earnings and it went up five times. So at that particular time, AOL was an outstanding leader in the market. So we don't let that prevent us from buying something that has a phenomenal new product that is the leader in that particular new niche that's developing. And we find that uh, in the stock market, every cycle has all kinds of new innovators and entrepreneurs, and those stocks aren't going to sell at rock bottom prices. The baseball players or basketball players, you know, who do they pay $25 million a year to? The, the worst player on the team? No. <laughs> you know, you touched a moment ago on some of the errors that people make, misunderstandings they have of how the market works. What are some of the most common and costly mistakes that you've seen over the years? Well, the first one is that people don't recognize that when you're investing, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. The professionals make a lot of mistakes. So no matter how smart you think you are, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Now, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to just sit with them and hope and, and say, oh, I think this is good, and besides, I'm getting a dividend, or old Joe told me this is a good stock? That's how you get hurt. So our first rule is you cut every single mistake, cut every single loss that you have. And when we did the chart models, we found that if you buy correctly off of a chart, a stock will not go down 8%. And that's where our sell rule starts. If you have a loss, you're, you're down 8% from what you paid, we say always sell it. No exceptions, no alibis, no excuses, because it's like a little insurance policy. If you do not do that, sooner or later, if you invest long enough, this stock that goes down 10% is now going to be down 20 because you're sitting waiting for it to come back. And then it's down 30, and then it's down 40, and then you're, you're psychologically trapped. You say, well, I can't sell it now because it's already down so much. And when we do our scientific measures of all the stocks that were successful or all the leaders, we found that when a leader finally tops, its average correction is 72%. It may take it a year to do that, and you're sitting there hoping and waiting and hoping and waiting, and I have news for everybody. The market does not know who you are, and it doesn't care what you hope or would like to see happen. So you have to get real and understand what the market is doing and how it works and then follow it, not try to tell it what it ought to do that you would like to have it do, okay? Bill, let's switch gears, talk a little bit about the market now and 
How you decide when to be in the market or when it's time to sell and raise cash, how would you advise an individual investor to handle that situation? Well, we invented rules on that also, and incidentally, the reason we came up with so many rules is very early on, many years ago, I made all the kind of mistakes that everybody makes, and I would have to go back and figure, now what did I do wrong, and, and how am I going to correct that, and, and what's the answer to this? And I found that most of the bad mistakes were made when the general market was rolling over and topping and everything was going down. And I figured you have to have some kind of a method to tell when is the general market starting to get into trouble. And we tested all the other things. And uh, we don't follow any technical analysts and what they think or what they, they say, but we do track the major market indexes, the, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange. And we track them on a day-by-day -day basis on the price and volume changes. And we have built models of what the general market indexes look like when they top. And we've got every top going back for over 100 years. And we've uh, got every bottom when the market finally hit bottom and it turned around and started a new bull market. So we developed rules based, again, on the same concept that we did for trying to figure out what does a, a new stock market leader look like? What are the variables? What are the characteristics that show up before it's going to have a big move? What we found, Kate, was that when the market tops, you're usually advancing and advancing, and at some point, you'll start seeing some days where the market closes off a little bit, but the volume is picked up. Through our models, we've determined that when you get five or six days over a short period of maybe four or five weeks where you're getting these distribution days piling up, by the time you get five or six of them, usually that market is going to roll over and it's getting too much distribution, it's going to top, and it's going down. And this works uh, very accurately. Uh, it'll miss fire every once in a while, but it, it will not miss a major market top. As a side note, when I came up with this system a number of years ago, we never checked back to 1929 to see how it would have handled 1929. It nailed the top two days after the top. And you had your days of distribution, two or three before the top, and then a couple after. The system has gotten us out of every major bear market for quite a number of cycles. So in other words, and this is kind of key. We're not listening to what somebody in Wall Street thinks the market ought to do. It ought to be bought, or it ought to be sold, or it ought to this, or I believe that. We could care less about that. We're tracking the market itself, seeing what is it actually doing day by day as it's doing it, waiting to watch to see when all of a sudden it changes its nature and it does something that is abnormal that always happens when you're topping. And that's how we make our decisions. So if, if somebody asks me the question, what do you think the market's going to do? I don't know what it's going to do, but I'm tracking it very carefully. And when it starts doing what it's going to do, I'm going to be able to analyze that and see, hey, is this acting wrong? And I've got to start backing away. So for the uh, listeners to this, I would suggest that you get your investor's business daily and read the big picture because they're tracking this all the time and when you have five or six distribution days they're going to be showing it in their little market pulse saying there have been six distribution days and they're going to change their situation to saying market is now in a correction our people do pretty well with this but i would suggest that uh, you know get get the book how to make money in stocks and read there's a whole chapter on general market how to recognize tops this current version shows the 07 top when it occurred. 